Hi, this is the part one of the chapter overview video for chapter six, application of Newton's laws. So this is a chapter with a lot of uh, examples, and I recommend that you read through each one of those examples and try going through them on your own. And, and so, uh, so this is the week that we are properly teaching standard strategy. It's a four-step strategy that we teach in this class. Now, the way your textbook um, numbers organizes the Newton's law problem-solving strategy is a little different. They don't have it in four steps. Um, and uh, I have lecture video that actually kind of points those out and gives you, you some alignment between how your textbook covers it and how we cover it. And, you know, they are covering the same thing, just organized a little differently. I obviously prefer the way we do it. <laughs> uh, now, and this is one of the reasons I prefer the way we do it. So your textbook in section 6.1, it gives you a list of um, uh, problem-solving strategy steps, which is great. Now, some of this is duplicative of what you have seen. You know, steps one through three here is talking about identifying physical principles, Newton's laws, <laughs> sketch the situation, uh, result is a free body diagram. And the thing is here, the textbook already gave you the steps for drawing free body diagram. They did it in section 5.7. So I don't know why they split it off into two different chapters. But in section 5.7, they already covered the constructing free body diagrams. So those steps one through three is really uh, it's referring to this. <laughs> so you know, in, um, in the way we teach standard strategy, um, this covers uh, this would be step number one. This covers step number two and. Are they? Yeah, so I actually don't uh, recommend this at all. I've already mentioned how I hate it, so I won't waste more time on that. But so, um, but I will, um, I will um, consider this much. If you are following what the textbook is teaching you, I can't get too mad at you because it is one of the valid approaches. And so, if you prefer to follow textbook. Fine, I won't stop you, but I recommend the standard strategy, the four-step strategy that we teach. And for that, please watch the lecture videos. There's um, I covered that strategy in detail a couple times, and there are a ton of examples, like two dozen uh, examples of me just solving problems. Now, in this section 6.1, you will see something similar. Your textbook has a ton of examples. Basically, you know, so this is a pretty long section. And this entire section is just examples of different situations where they follow those strategies. So I, I think it's good for you to uh, just read it through once. And then, because sometimes when you're reading through examples, you will feel like you understood everything. But then later on, when you see the exact same thing, you are at loss. Because, you know, when you thought, when you are watching someone else do it and you thought you understood it, you really didn't. That's really common, you know. I watch someone play basketball. I feel like I got the game. But then when I have to play it, like, I'm, I'm no good. <laughs> so uh, what I would recommend is after reading through the section, take a break, like half a day, a day. And then come back and, you know, read through it again, but um, in sections. Like with each of the examples, you can just, uh, you know, read the example, and then try working it out on your own. You know, it asks, what is the drag force of the water on the barge registering the motion? Okay, see if you can answer it on your own. Give it some try. You've read the solution once before, so hopefully you remember some of it. And then um, if you can do it, then great. Then you've learned how to do this. And, um, and, you know, anything that you forget over the long term, there'll be enough repetition that you will eventually remember it. And uh, um, somehow, as you are trying it again, maybe in five, ten minutes, you, you are still stuck, then you can keep reading on and read the solutions again, and maybe try to figure out what was it that you couldn't quite remember. So there are a ton of examples in this long section, and I think uh, uh, reading through, reattempting the examples, that would be really productive way to use this section. Um, a, a lot of these examples, you will also see them covered in homework, in lecture. So you got a lot of different presentations of it. Um, and, and I think that's all beneficial. Yeah. Really, the only limiting factor is 
how much time do you have? <laughs> At some point, you know, you do have to balance other things you have to do. So that's a six, section 6.1. Section 6.2 finally covers the friction in some detail. So I think we did mention friction in uh, chapter 5 under common forces, but we didn't go into as much detail as we should, especially distinguishing static and kinetic friction. This is something that um, people um, uh, get confused with isn't the right word. Uh, it takes time and effort to pe for people to learn uh, how to correctly identify and use them in physics problem solving. And uh, just the one thing that uh, I will point out in the other lectures that I do take a little bit of disagreement with the, your textbook. Your textbook describes the friction as a force that opposes relative motion. And uh, I can think of some counterexamples. So that's not the phrasing I would recommend. Um, what I would recommend is uh, focus on the contact surfaces and think of a friction as a force that prevents the sliding between the contact surfaces. Uh, if you want my counterexample, watch my lecture. I have a counterexample there where two um, objects are, um, I guess, getting into relative motion and it's a friction that causes that relative motion rather than opposing. But it's still true that in that counterexample, the sliding between surfaces are being opposed by friction. Um, so it, it, this uh, matters in uh, corner cases where uh, you have to do a, a bit of work to figure out the direction of friction force. And uh, back to the distinction between static and kinetic friction. So with the static friction, the proper way to think about it is that it's a, a friction that enforces um, a condition. So you know when you are uh, trying to push a heavy crate across the floor, uh, as long as you are in the regime for static friction, static friction responds to what you do. It increases so that the net force will be zero, so that the crate won't move. It won't, you know, the, the bottom surface of crate won't slide against the top surface of the floor. That's what static friction force does. And it's basically whatever amount it needs to be so that it can be there. In some sense, it's kind of like a normal force. Normal force is what prevents objects from pushing into the surface. It's whatever amount it needs to be so that objects don't push into the surface. Now, the di distinction between normal force and friction force, it, the way we handle it is, with the normal force, there's no upper limit. I mean, in reality, there is. Objects can break. But the way we cover it, normal force, no limit. No matter how hard, there will always be enough normal force to push it up. With the friction, we acknowledge that limit. So if you push really hard enough, it does slip. And now the static friction goes into kinetic friction. So that is represented in the way we describe static friction, which is that we give it an upper limit. It, this is an inequality. Static friction is less than or equal to this quantity here, coefficient times the normal force. But because I, I think a lot of the questions we ask tend to ask you about that edge case, you know, what's the maximum, what's uh, the like uh, uh, extreme amount before it starts to slip. People for, tend to forget about the inequality part and focus on the equality, but don't forget the inequality part. That um, There are some trick questions that I ask you, and those trick questions are built on you forgot about the inequality. Um, kinetic friction is a lot easier. You, you have a formula. Just use the formula. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think I do point out this graph in a lecture, and this is a great illustration. So imagine you are pushing this crate. Um, if you apply no force, zero static friction, because you don't need it to have a zero um, acceleration, zero net force. But as you push, 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 static friction exactly increases so that the net force will be zero up to a limit, then it begins to slide, and then it goes into kinetic friction. So, um, yes, and you will have a lot of uh, example problems with the friction. So uh, look at those examples, get plenty of practice, and uh, then you'll learn to how to handle friction. Um, let's see here. I think the uh, rest of this uh, section is mostly this, um, you know, on more problem solving examples dealing with the friction, which you weren't dealing with in section 6.1. So I, the same advice applies, you know, read it through it, and then after having read it through it, take a break, half a day, a day, and then come back, read the question again, see if you can answer it on your own without the solution you've read it through before, 
if you can't, that means um, it means you know whatever you are doing is not teaching you physics. So uh, you know, getting help on that is probably where my office hours are more useful than any fixed advice I can give you. And I've mentioned how much I hate this, but. Uh, if you want to know the style in which I do the standard strategy, watch my lecture videos. The way I, I draw these component vectors is not the way your textbook does it. I hate it. Somehow, if you like this better, all right, your textbook does it, so I can't yell at you for that <laughs> if you prefer it. But I don't think you would prefer it. This is so confusing. Like Nothing about that is any better. <laughs> all right, uh, so I think that's uh, enough. Um, so... Your textbook covers some things that we won't cover. Uh, now, we do cover centripetal force, but I'll cover that in part two over the overview video because um, this week we are skipping out on centripetal force. Next week, we'll cover centripetal force. So, um, so I'll skip that for now. Section 6.4, drag force. Uh, we don't cover it at all. I mean, we do acknowledge that it exists, but like this formula, don't worry about it. You won't ever have to use it. If you ever have to get quantitative with the drag force, well, we'll give you the formula. It might be this. But under some conditions, the drag force can actually be proportional to velocity. If that's the case, we'll give you the formula. Really, the, um, the context in which we come closest to dealing with the section 6.4 is where we tell you that uh, something is at uh, terminal velocity. So... Um, so you should know how to interpret that statement. When something is at terminal velocity, what that means is that person, that object's velocity remains constant, which means acceleration must be zero, which means there's a zero net force on that object or person that's falling under the influence of gravity. Um, so that's the as far like that's as much of six, section six point four as we cover. And that treatment is pretty easy, you know, set net force equal to zero, and the rest of it is just regular problems of standard strategy. So I think that uh, everything in um, this uh, first part of a chapter six overview video, all this detailed stuff. Uh, so we don't cover it, relying on for anyone who's interested, you can read it in the textbook. And um, the kind of classes where you'd have to deal with uh, like air resistance, um, you will learn so much more about air resistance in those upper division engineering physics classes than we could ever teach you in this class. So, um, so if you are interested, read the textbook and just look forward to dealing with that in your upper division. So, so that's uh, it for this uh, part one of chapter six overview video. I'll come back next week for part two. So until then, 